Oh, what a mess. This is Neil Schneider from Meant to Be Seen. Welcome back to my messy basement. Now, uh, today we've got two more interviews for you. Um, I was at Seagraph 2016 just a few weeks ago, and of course I got to see some, some pretty amazing stuff. Uh, first up is Robert Dernan. He is head of cinematics for a company called Leia 3D. I got the chance to interview Robert at last year's Seagraph, and uh, you know we we basically we caught each other's eye. It was like, oh, it's Neil. So we connected, and he showed me their latest stuff. Really exciting. Um, what they do is they create glasses-free stereoscopic 3D technology for mobile devices, and their stuff is actually getting used. Their technology is going to be installed in future smartphones, and he's going to tell us all about it in uh, his interview segment. Following Robert, we've got Andrew Beal. He is the CEO of WorldViz. If you don't know WorldViz, you should. They are one of the foremost virtual reality cave companies. So a cave is a, literally a virtual reality room. And they offer all kinds of software tools for head-mounted displays. You name it. They've been in the business forever. Big honor that Andrew's joining us today. So before we get started with the program, I just want to share some really quick highlights uh, pertaining to Immersed taking place October 16th to 18th at the Ontario Science Centre. It's going to be a big deal because in addition to being a core professional event, we've got over 8,000 8, consumers uh, coming down to the Ontario Science Centre to check out Immersive Technology. Now, uh, two things. First, I want to send out a big thank you for the to the virtual real sorry the Toronto Virtual Reality Meetup Group. They invited me uh, er, last week to talk about Immersed, and they completely get it. I mean, the, you know, the East Coast viable market, underserved, and uh, I'm really grateful that you know for for all their support. In fact, Stefan Tangway, he's going to be one of our MCs during Immersed 2016. So ambitious event. We're grateful for all the help. Uh, now we also discovered there was an error with the startup tables. When people went on the Eventbrite uh, page to get their tickets, part of it is to apply for a starter program because we have a very, very deeply discounted program so that, you know, Companies that are just getting in, in, into the, the, the fray of virtual reality and immersive tech can affordably participate. It's, it's you know, we're, we're, we're just happy to get certain expenses covered. But uh, what happened was it showed that the tickets were, were sold out prematurely. And sure enough, people can still, of course, apply for startup tickets. So uh, check it out. We hope you can participate. We've got, again, over 8,000 consumers are going to be there. Plus, we have the core professional event, and we've got top people coming in from all over the world. So you can learn more at getimmersed.com. We hope to see you there. On that note, let's get the program started right after this. To my immediate right is Robert Dernan, head of cinematics for Leia 3D. Welcome, welcome back to the program, Robert. Thank you. It's good to see you again this year. F funny story. I'm walking into the exhibit hall. Robert stops me. He goes, wait, wait, wait. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I'm showing my badge. I'm not going to be allowed in. And then I realize, oh, it's Robert. So this is the second time I'm, I'm meeting you, Robert, and of course your your product has enhanced significantly. Quite a bit over the last year. We've uh, we've brought in an excellent head of engineering, and he's uh, really improved with us the backlight, the general technology, and we've been also working with some good outsourced studios on content. Okay, so well, for, for those who are completely unfamiliar, what is Leia 3D? What does Leia 3D do? Leia 3D is a holographic display company. We make a multi-view display that essentially is a, it, it uses a diffractive of grading technology in order to produce a uh, light field image above the display. We have a, we have a, this current model is eight by four views and they're being sent out to the, to the user in sub, in known directions. So just for those who are unfamiliar, this is a glasses free stereoscopic 3D display. Absolutely. Yes. And we, uh, and this generation is due to be on a phone next year in the third quarter. So that's amazing. It's going to be like a holographic, stereoscopic 3D phone. Now, you, you mentioned different types of parallax. Uh, I mean, what angles could this be viewed from? So currently, this there's a active viewing de of 30 degrees plus minus from the center. We have uh, 30 degrees of parallax uh, vertically and 60 degrees vertically. I mean, 
horizontally and vertically. I reversed it, yes. So, that's okay. So, well, what I, what I tried it out, and what I thought was unique was, you know, normally when you look at a stereoscopic 3D display or an auto stereoscopic where, you know, you don't have glasses, you, you can usually see it at a horizontal angle. But what I thought was unique in this case is I could see it from higher angles. I could look from above and, yeah. and below. Well, from a, fixed, from a fixed viewpoint, there is parallax. And outside of those bounds, the image doesn't actually view correctly. But it gives us an opportunity to create privatized content. For example, one user seeing something completely separate than the other, or to be able to fill in some of those views with pixels that would disrupt what people outside are, are seeing. Yeah. So, so it's a it's a huge victory. I know you can't name the company yet, but I, I understand that a, a smartphone maker is going to be supporting this technology. Definitely. Yeah. And can you speak to some of the content that you're looking forward to? Any any innovative stuff in the works to, to make 3D available? Well, we've spent a lot of time working with Unity, and we have a plugin that's shippable now and is going to be available in the asset store shortly. Um, and we've started working with some of some well-known automotive manufacturers on potential prototypes for future for, for future vehicles. Um, but more practical applications on the phone would be things like scanning conversions to 3D, viewing 3D depth images, and uh, very obviously MRI scanning, and anything that you would need to navigate in a 3D space. Yeah. This is really exciting stuff. I wish you a lot of success with this. If developers are interested in supporting it, is, it can they reach out to you? Yeah, please. You can visit us on our site, which is leia3d.com. Or and slash developers, the information is there, and for development partners as well, we have devices that are available to 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 work with. Okay, yeah. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for for joining us. I'm glad to see you again, Neil. Thanks. This is Neil Schneider for MTBS at Seagraph 2016. Back with more right after this. <laughs> to my immediate right is Andrew Beal, CEO of WorldViz. Welcome to the program, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, <laughs> I know virtual reality, of course, very popular within the last couple of years, but WorldViz has been at this for a very long time, and I'm being modest when I say a very long time. What, what does WorldViz do, for those unfamiliar? So we've been at it since, as a company, 2002. Um, myself, uh, professionally, since about 1992. So yeah, we're going back uh, a couple decades here. Uh, WorldViz uh, focuses almost exclusively on VR in the professional setting. VR for business, VR for researchers, uh, academics. Um, unlike many of the other companies that are like household words today, we're not going after the gaming market. That's a, that's a, that's a different space. You know, I, every so often I get Google alerts for all the different things happening in the market, and every so often I'll see a headline, you know, VR being used for enterprise, as though it's like the first time it's ever been done, but, right. you know, VR never actually left. It's been used That's continually for, right. for decades. Can you talk about some of the applications virtual reality is being used for a commercial point of view? Sure, yeah. Um, VR, from our experience, in my experience actually going back to the 90s, VR has been on a con continuum, albeit sort of a slow growth, but within research circles, academics, and sort of Fortune 100 companies that are large enough to almost have in-house a university think tank, VR has been on a steady growth. So that kind of speaks to our initial customer base was university research labs with um, government-funded projects. And this is like NSF, NIH, uh, Air Force, uh, uh, Navy, Army research. Um, so non-military non in that sense, though. And then in the companies that were broad enough in their, in their, in their outlook to build a, uh, a research center to look at how are we going to do X, and X might be training in 10 years from now. And those have been some of the aircraft manufacturers. How will we achieve training so that when the aircraft first rolls off the assembly line, we have experts on how to do the disassembly? So what I remember of WorldViz and is that you did a lot of virtual reality caves. Uh, I hope I'm using the right words. Um, you're, are you still in that in that market? Yeah. So a cave is actually um, the term for a an immersive 3D projection system where the 3D is actually being tied to your head viewpoint just as with a headset. So if I move around, look around, squat, crawl, the, the images on the 3D screens are all being updated. We, we have, it depends on the industry, so architecture construction, which is a major part of our business right now, about half the clients there, maybe 75% of the clients insist on a cave. And it has to do with actually the face-to-face -face contact. So when I wear a pair of shutter glasses, I'm still seeing your face, largely. I'm seeing your reaction to my design. 
your body language is incredibly important for that type of collaboration. So we find those clients are not satisfied with the headset, even though it's more immersive, but they've lost the sense of the social immersion. I'm, I'm seeing behind us, you're showing HTC, Oculus, you're obviously using head-mounted displays. It's not a cave that we have here, that would right. be a really big exhibit. When HMDs were introduced affordably, did it impact the business? Like, I, I mean, did, did the cave suddenly become less important, or, or is it just that they're meeting a completely different need? Are there things yeah. that happen in a cave that can only happen in a cave versus an HMD device? Yeah, good question. So, when the sort of the, the revolution of headsets came around, what it basically did was it sliced the cost of a headset down by two orders of magnitude. So we were selling a system so with a headset alone was maybe thirty five thousand dollars, so now three fifty, right? So that has only boosted business kind of across the board for us. Um, so yes, we're selling more caves. There's just more awareness. Um, I think we used to have to work a lot harder to explain what VR is to convince um, uh, a, a business leader that VR is a, a valid tool because it was very, very niche, was not spoken of in the mainstream. You're now having business leaders say, ah, I, I just realized that the company X invested, you know, say $2 billion in, in this technology. You know, it's worth me looking at, so. You must be thrilled because if we were to say 10 years ago, maybe a handful of people knew what they were doing in virtual reality. Now you've got like, that, maybe I'm exaggerating when I say a handful, probably more. Um, but now you've got thousands of people that are, you know, deeming themselves as virtual reality experts. Has this impacted your business in a, in a good way, having more expertise out there working in the field? I think the talent pool, I would say, yeah, I would agree, ha has grown. Um, uh, that means we can, we can bring in uh, talent faster, we can outsource, I think, more easily. Um, you know, I think the the sense of virtuality and, and its history actually goes, for me, goes back to uh, flight simulation. Actually goes back to the 1940s, a very mechanical-based flight simulator. So, you know, I think the sense of what is VR, there, there's the sensory immersion sensation of VR, but then there's also the VR of, of creating an uh, interactive, sophisticated um, uh, experience that's synthetic. And that, that there's actually, I would say, there's been a wide talent pool uh, in, in that realm. And, you know, like this show here, SIGGRAPH, computer graphics and that simulation really, to me, kind of, you know, bleeds into, into the greater definition of VR, so. Now, help me understand. Now, when I thought of caves, I think of the physicality of the cave. And we're, you're obviously working with head-mounted displays. What are the WorldViz core products right now? So what, like, what are you ultimately marketing here? Uh, WorldViz, our, our core, I would say our passion is our software. So we make a, a VR development platform called Vizard that really, uh, it, it, it ties together whatever you as a customer, whatever your dream, your experience, your application is, you program in a, in a high-level scripting language called Python. So we've embraced kind of an easy access, rapid prototyping philosophy since 2002. Vizard then connects to any device. So whether it's a display, a tracker, a glove, um, and it's with the technology we call VizConnect. So very much a hardware agnostic sort of sim uh, simulation uh, platform. So what you're seeing here at the show is an Oculus and a Vive connected together. We could, if we had the space, like you say, connect also a cave user together. All that's on the Vizard platform. Um, in addition, we make a tracking system. We call it uh, these days a warehouse scale tracking. We've been doing this for a decade, so we can track easily a 10 by 10 meter space. Um, uh, we've tracked up to a, a 30 by 30 meter space. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's really designed for immersive VR, can connect to any headset. The same system can work for a cave. So those two together are the two building blocks that we bring to the table with, just as important, our service and our support. So we're one of the only companies that will deliver sort of a software, hardware, and a solution with support to, to a client, stand behind it year after year, somebody that uh, you know business can count on. Now, in, in the days that case were, I guess, they, well, I'm sure they're still popular, they're still obviously in active use. It could be, for a decent one, it could be in the tens of thousands of dollars. It's not a small, and that's actually on the lower end of the spectrum. Zero, add another yeah, zero to yeah. that. So, it's a lot uh, of money. typical. A classic cave, the projectors alone are in the 50 to 100K range for the projectors. Um, we, we support those. We've not actually manufactured those ourselves. We, we, we build a, a, a lighter weight cave that uses um, uh, what are referred to as ultra short throw projectors. 
And so you can get away with doing front projection. So with these projectors, and we have one, we're using one right here, just not in 3D mode today. You can get, um, if, I, if I'm building a cave that has a wall height of say um, uh, 10 feet, the, the projection angles are such that I can get to less than three feet before I cast a shadow on that. So that means I can put this into a, an existing meeting room without needing to use mirror bounces and taking up a huge amount of real estate. Because for businesses, it often comes down to the real estate cost, meaning am I needing a 30 foot by 30 foot room to house a 15 by 15 foot cave? That's expensive on a, on a recurring basis, right? Not just the initial investment. So, so we can go in and almost retrofit an existing space with, with front walls, side walls, um, the floor and ceiling is an area we often don't touch, but often that's that's an extra that doesn't earn us keep for what people of, um, of, of cave consumers are needing. What, what I'd be interested to know is that now that we've got these affordable head-mounted displays, do you find you're selling more product because the devices are more readily available? Are there more companies able to benefit from virtual reality design and, and use than they previously would have been able to? More companies? Let me rephrase. Yeah. Let's say a cave used to be in the 100K plus, mm -hmm. okay? But now we've got head-mounted displays like HTC Vive and, and the Oculus Rift. Um, your software obviously mixes with that. Yeah. Are you finding that more companies or more enterprise are taking advantage of virtual reality than before for commercial purpose than you know, they otherwise yeah. would have? Yeah, no, absolutely. We're finding more companies are, are getting involved in utilizing both uh, goggle-based and so the cave base, so, uh, a cave can be had for much less than 100,000 uh, today with, uh, with these type of projectors, the ultra short throws. So no, across the board, uh, in the areas that we're, we're finding, um, probably the, the, the fastest, easiest, low-hanging fruit style traction is architecture construction. Those clients already are sophisticated in digital design. They have their assets, albeit in all different formats. So there's still kind of the content conversion problem. But the content's easy in the sense that you convert it and it's ready to go. You can, you can actually satisfy the customer's needs. Next is uh, marketing. VR is kind of going through the roof in marketing uses. So we work a lot. We do custom applications for various companies that want to just have a VR um, a kiosk at a trade show or for some sort of major PR event. Uh, next after that is probably training. So it, I mean, with the cost of a headset being what it is today, there's incredible excitement in enterprise right now for, for investing in a high quality trainer and now you can send that out into the field for you know a hundredth of the cost of what it would have been uh, just five years ago. There's a lot of opportunity out there. Absolutely, yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, thank you, it was very good. This is Neil Schneider from MTBS, back with more right after this. Thanks again for visiting My Messy Basement. If you want to be a guest on the program, if you have got questions, ideas, by all means, send us an email, neilsmessybasement at mtbs3d.com. Also, you know, I, I think this is incredibly important, huge opportunity that we're, we're developing, Immersed 2016. You can learn more about that at getimmersed.com. We hope to see you there. On that note, I look forward to speaking with you again next week. Thank you.